and welcome to physical <clears throat> diagnostics and today is the first lecture from my side and I would like to start as like you had covered many topics okay so regarding symptoms or like you had done fever and uh, <clears throat> You guys have done fever and chest pain, dyspnea, cyanosis, upper GIT bleed, which is hematemesis, hemoptysis, and cough. So, <clears throat> two or three symptoms are left, which we are going to cover. One of those symptoms is, is edema. So, I'm going to talk about that. And then we are going to cover joint us, for example, and in the physical examinations. Uh, what you had covered is, uh, as you know, like physical examination. Uh, if I if I get the chance, I'm going to teach you physical examination <coughs> practically. Okay, that what what I do with most of the students. Uh, but practical demonstration in the class is better than uh, what we can learn here. So, in physical examination. I think you guys have done general physical examination, cardiovascular examination, abdominal examination, respiratory examination. Uh, so what is left is neurological examination and the examination of uh, a lump, for example, or the examination of the joints, how we can do that. So I'm going to cover them. And one examination which we have to cover is neuro neurology examination. So we will cover neurology examination uh, one lecture I would talk about the examination of the joints and then examination of examination of a lump and then what we will do is like we are going to start with the lab diagnosis so talking about the symptoms uh, <clears throat> like today what I choose is edema and uh, first of all what is the symptoms so Symptoms are subjective and made up of patient's own experience and feelings about abnormal physiological bodily functions or changes from normal such as pain, cough, palpitations, which indicates a state of disease in his or her body. So, so symptoms may make up the main content, the first step of inquiry or on how we take the history. And the important clues and basis of the diagnosis and differential diagnosis. So, <clears throat> before going to edema, like I would like to give you the concept, first of all, uh, why we study, like uh, because this is a base, you can say, a very basic thing which we are studying nowadays, or just the start of your physical, what you can say, your baseline career, right? Clinical career. So, Basically, symptom, uh, the definition is correct, but uh, remember, symptoms are not uh, subjective feelings. Rather, symptom, symptoms can be subjective as well as objective feelings. So, for example, someone who feel uh, fatigued, so, of course, like the doctor cannot see either the patient is fatigued or not, so that is a completely subjective feeling. But someone who have cough, so... He go to the doctor with cough and the doctor can see the patient coughing as well. So you can say um, cough is both objective as well as subjective uh, symptom. So what I am saying like symptoms, symptoms may be objective as well as subjective right so simply I gave you the example I gave you the example of uh, cough and tiredness right or fatigue right so <clears throat> this thing so th this is a very important point and why we are studying this thing because whatever uh, you're studying like fever or cough or hemoptysis or hemoptysis or jaundice um, these are the features by way, like how by how the patient they present to the doctor, and then it's a doctor duty. And what the doctors do, like they they 
they inquire about that symptom and they uh, for example let's talk about tiredness okay uh, now <clears throat> see tiredness whenever it comes in medicine or when the patients present with tiredness um, it, it can have a lot of causes uh, for example uh, thi tiredness can be caused by thyroid disorders okay um, tiredness can be caused by infections like infective endocarditis because I have to give the examples which you can understand or tiredness can be caused by rheumatological conditions Uh, conditions right uh, tiredness can, can, be, can be caused by uh, like this can be a side effect of certain drugs as well as it could be due to anemia um, it could be due to malignancies right so simply like and many 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 more causes of course like uh, I'm just giving so of course like if the patient is coming and saying the doctor I am tired right so I I will be thinking of number of causes, right? Uh, I will I will start thinking about infections, inflammations, malignancies, anemia. Uh, so I, you can say in my mind there could be hundred thousand or at least like tens of causes, right? Which would be there now? Of course, the patient will be suffering from one or two causes, not more than that, right? Or uh, wh why we take history is like because we have to look in the history uh, either the patient have a thyroid disorder or either the patient have infection or either he's using some drugs or things like this so of course I'm going to inquire about each and everything so uh, like uh, again I told you guys before like what is the way um, we can like one of the mnemonic you can say is like I remember most of the things by mnemonics OD para is one of the mnemonic O is for onset D is for duration uh, okay P is for progression A is for aggravating factors R is for relieving factors and the last A is associated symptoms so what what I will be doing I will simply ask the patient uh, when is the onset of this tiredness okay uh, how long it is there uh, how it is progressing it's becoming bad <clears throat> it's the same any of the symptoms you have uh, anything which relieve it okay and any associated features with that, that thing so uh, simply like uh, I will keep on getting the answers and w what will happen uh, I am going to uh, make my mind okay you know this could not be the chance or this could be a chance or th this condition can be ruled out and this condition can be one of the cause so simply what I am doing I'm fine-tuning my uh, uh, diagnosis and like by the end of the history I would be left with one or two um, you can say or three and four differential diagnosis and then I will do examination then I will go for investigations and then I will be going for uh, diagnosis and then I will go to banish that thing so simply uh, now the important thing is like in medicine uh, <laughs> Uh, why you are studying these symptoms like uh, or these features is just to tell you uh, because uh, like in our medical school they don't teach us diagnostic as a different subject rather they teach us uh, you can say bedside medicine or clinical medicine right so in that one of course you, you will study the conditions and in the conditions the symptoms will come and when the symptoms will come you will study about the symptoms and you would know okay what to think about for example you had done chest pain so of course like if, if a patient will come to me and say doctor I have a chest pain so what will happen I'm not going to think about uh, myocardial infarction okay or what I will do first of all I will see I, I will see uh, where is the site of that chest pain what is the severity what is the character when it did it happen either there is any radiation if there is any radiation so where where it is radiating to 
and I will ask him the severity. I will ask him the aggravating and relieving factors, and I will ask about the associated features. So simply, I know like chest pain have different causes like. Uh, it could be due to cardiac causes like myocardial infarction, pericarditis, aortic dissection. It could be due to respiratory causes like pneumonia, uh, pleural effusion, pleurisy, lung cancer. It could be due to esophageal or gastric problems like nutcracker esophagitis gastritis and things like this right or it could be due to chest pain can be due to musculoskeletal reasons and chest pain can be psychogenic like psychogenic I, I mean to say the people who had panic attack when they had panic attack they complain that uh, we had a chest pain but they don't have any myocardial infarction or any other thing so many of the people who have panic attack, they started thinking that maybe they are going to die because of this. Chest pain, okay? So that's why we are studying this thing. So I think like this is very important to uh, tell you guys, you know, why you are studying certain thing and what's the importance of that thing. So that is about the symptom. And of course, like symptom, the, most of the patients, when they come, they use a different name for the symptom. For example, the patients can say that they have bleeding in their cuff or bleeding in their vomit. They don't know what is hemoptysis or hematemesis, right? It's you guys who know. So when we talk to the patient, we talk in a different language. But when we take history and we write history for medical records, we write it in a different language. We write it in medical terms. Okay. So now, for example, in uh, edema, when the patients come, they don't say we have edema. Rather, they say that we have uh, swelling. For example, if someone have edema of the legs, you know, they say like, my, my feet are swollen, they, like they're swelling on my feet or there is like my, there is swelling around my eyes or there is swelling around my elbows or there is swelling at my XYZ place, right? Rather, they will not use the word edema. So you can say that what you will notice that is called as a sign. So. Maybe the patient will use, or you can say like this, that uh, patients, they, they use, sorry, they use non-medical terms, right? And when you talk to patient, use non-medical terms easy terms okay that's very important don't use jargons uh, like you don't have to show the patient your knowledge rather you have to take information from the patient right so you must not use medical terms you not use medical jargons you must use simple language which patients can understand and that is very important when especially you are practicing medicine in your own language you study medicine in English but you have to start practice medicine in other languages right in many of the cases so that's very that's a very important thing so uh, one thing which uh, I want to talk about is called as uh, positive symptoms or uh, negative symptoms uh, what's the positive symptoms uh, <clears throat> like something which we don't normally have but now due to certain condition we are started having that thing it means like there is addition in some of something in the body or there is 
addition of something in your uh, system uh, for example uh, normally a normal person don't don't have any abnormal sensations but what if you have burning or and uh, tingling sensations in feet okay like most of the time diabetic people they have this thing burning and tingling sensations in their feet for when well, the diabetic people they have this thing burning and tingling sensation in that feet so normal person don't have so it means like it's a positive symptom okay it's a uh, it's a positive symptom right why it's not positive in this sense like it's a good symptom it's a positive symptom in this sense that this thing is not present in a normal person so now when it is present in someone it means like there is something new which is occurring okay on the other hand all the things which we have which we normally have and now due to certain conditions or due to certain um, abnormality uh, we get lost of that thing that is called as a negative symptom for example uh, in stroke or when you have some denervation or the nerve is damaged of some part and there is no sensation or you can say there is anesthesia not just anesthesia by the way uh, I will also say rather hyposthesia like the sensations are less so now uh, normal people they have <clears throat> sensations but now you don't have that sensation or that sensation that are decreased or hypoesthesia is there decreased sensation is there so it means like now which was present something in the body but now it is not there so these symptoms are called as negative symptoms okay so this one is like <clears throat> a very important thing to understand so uh, uh, what we are going to study today is edema right so <laughs> edema by definition edema like the simplest definition of edema is like collection of the fluid in uh, interstitial space simply okay so the the, the, the most you can say uh, once what happened like uh, I asked like this definition from uh, from students in the class I said like anyone can define edema so there is a guy who said like uh, hyper exudation of WBCs of I don't know like what kind of things he used so uh, one thing which I always say like don't put your life in difficulty you know if you had good concept you can give good definitions you don't have to memorize definitions as well so edema is like simply uh, there is collection of fluid right or uh, accumulation of fluid right so in the interstitial spaces so we call it as edema so uh, simply there is more water is there or that's why what happened is it's like the patients they, they say like oh, we have swelling in any part of the body okay of course like whenever there is edema uh, they don't have just uh, you can say uh, swelling but like they feel tightness also in that that region sometimes they feel the feelings are uncomfortable so many symptoms you can say are attached with edema and patients have their uh, own way to describe the things and being a doctor like uh, one very important thing is to catch exactly what the patient is saying to you that's a very important thing for example uh, many people it's not like this that you know uh, patients they, they describe even their condition exactly how they feel uh, for example uh, there is something called a syncope uh, there is something called as uh, dizziness there is something called as vertigo so all these feelings or all these conditions are different but in many languages patient have almost the same words for these things so uh, maybe he, it will give you a mislead or maybe you will be confused even uh, when like either what kind of condition the patient have right so 
like uh, this thing. So <coughs> now edema can be generalized or edema can be localized. Okay. So whenever it is generalized, of course, we say like the patient have generalized edema. When it is localized, we say that the patient have localized edema. Okay. And of course, like edema can occur anywhere. Okay. So sometimes in dependent parts of the body, what is the meaning of dependent when you are standing, for example? So uh, like due to gravity, the fluid should come towards your feet. When someone is a bedridden patient, bedridden patient, so he is on the bed for so long, like he's all the time laying down on the bed. So in that case, the edema will be towards the buttocks, towards the scapular region, towards the elbow regions, right? So of course, like due to gravity, the things will go towards the floor or earth, right? So that, that is the thing. So of course, like the patients, they, they feel they have feel the heaviness in the dependent parts where there is edema. Sometimes, you know, it's very hard to uh, move the limbs. Okay. So that's very important thing uh, in edema. So, okay, there is a thing called as dropsy. So dropsy is what when, it, when there is excessive accumulation of fluid in body cavity okay this is called as what this is called as dropsy so uh, what you can say dropsy have many uh, other 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 meanings as well okay so dropsy is simply when there is collection of the fluid in body cavities Okay, guys, so now, <clears throat> as I always say that, you know, if you will learn physiology in a good way, you will be, you will become a way good physician or doctor and the concepts will be very clear. Rather, it will be easy for you guys to understand the things very easy, like very clearly. So again, like in physiology, you know, there is a full chapter on, on edema and they had explained in very beautiful way uh, how edema develops and what is edema. So what happened is, uh, you can say, uh, what happened is uh, uh, in physiology, uh, Guyton, okay, uh, what, what is there, they have told easily like, you know, what is hydrostatic pressure, uh, what is uh, oncotic pressure, okay, what is osmotic pressure. So you can see over here, these are the arteries and these are the veins, okay, and the blood is flowing and of course there is filtration from here and it will go into the interstitial fluid and most of the fluid is reaps out here in the venule side and they will go to the veins, okay. So there is hydrostatic pressure in the capillaries, there is mechanical pressure in the interstitial space, there is osmotic pressure of plasma and there is osmotic pressure of tissue fluid, right. So, uh, if you want to go in really in more details, you will go through Guyton and you will be having a very good concept about edema. So, you can see over here the main factors of edema. Water and sodium retention. So, remember this thing that, you know, in our intravascular space, the main uh, thing which define the amount of uh, uh, fluid or you can say osmolarity of the plasma is sodium ions you know when you will lose more sodium ions in the urine basically you will lose water also and when you will gain more sodium ions maybe you, your body is going to retain more and more sodium and that's what RAAS system is doing renin angiotensin aldosterone system so see water molecules move from a more dilute solution to a more concentrated solution. What is written over here is you know osmosis and the other factor is increased capillary filtration pressure, increased capillary permeability, decreased plasma. Sorry this is not osmotic, this is oncotic. 
on contact pressure right or uh, one of the thing one of the factor is obstruction of the lymphatic channels so see whenever the sodium and water is retaining in the body due to any condition due to kidney condition for example due to abnormal release of aldosterone or whatever is there what is there like there is more and more sodium more and more water in the in the body and the the fluid will increase and what will happen they are going to escape into the interstitial spaces or there is increased capillary filtration pressure there is increased capillary permeability due to damage to the capillaries there is decreased plasma on cortic pressure what is on cortic pressure it is you know the pressure which is, which is created by uh, the proteins so any condition in which there is hypoproteinemia less proteins in the blood or you can say hypoalbuminemia less albumin in the in the blood for example in liver conditions in which your body is not forming enough proteins or for example in uh, renal conditions for when like your kidneys cannot retain proteins in the blood rather your kidneys will start losing more and more proteins so ultimately there will be less proteins in the body and what will happen that uh, <coughs> there will be decrease on cortic pressure so that's why you know in liver failure people have ascites so what is ascites it is any much is collection of the fluid that's for the patients of renal failure they have edema especially around the eyes they, they it can cause puffy eyes and obstruction of the lymphatics when the lymphatics are blocked of course uh, the fluid is not uh, reabsorbed back so of course like it can also cause edema so again like this is uh, <clears throat> One more photograph showing the same thing. Uh, blood flow, capillary, venous, and this is arterial and interstitial fluid is there. There is hydro hydrostatic pressure. So net filtration pressure is equal to blood hydrostatic pressure plus interstitial fluid osmotic pressure minus blood collide osmotic pressure plus interstitial fluid osmotic pressure. So again, you know, there is a Starling equation if you remember, and Starling equation. So that is on cortex. Sorry, I always say. Uh, so in Starling equation, what is in Starling equation? Like there is capillary hydrostatic pressure, there is interstitial hydrostatic pressure, or you can say the pressure of the water. Then there is plasma on cortic pressure or plasma protein on cortic pressure. And then there is one pressure that is interstitial on cortic pressure. So remember whenever like the proteins are there, so here you know they can retain the fluid. But whenever the proteins are less, they are, cannot retain the fluid. Rather the fluid will start taking out. So that is the important thing, you know. Again, I will refer Guyton, you know. Guyton is the best book. So simply guys, you know, whenever there is uh, edema and you know, the patient comes with swelling. So first of all, which is very important thing is to uh, see, first of all, you will ask the patient when the swelling started, okay, how long it is there and which parts of the body is affected, how bad is the swelling, how it is progressing any of the signs and symptoms you had, any relieving or aggravating factors. Now I'll tell you clinically, you know, a very common thing clinically. Women, especially pregnant, pregnant patients, you know, they had leg edema. Why? Because there is a baby in the uterus which causes pressure on the vessels of the lower limbs drainage. So the fluid it will get resistance and the venous blood flow is not good so what happens like the blood 
pressure in the lower limbs is increased and simply there is more and more filtration and they may have edema. One more thing, for example, if you are going on a long trip by air, sometimes when you keep on sitting on your chair, one chair for 5, 6, 7 or like 10, 14 hours, you will feel like your red legs, your feet are swollen. Okay, And when your feet are swollen, what is there is like uh, prolonged sitting can be an aggravating factor. And one of the relieving really factors is what? Elevation of the legs. So what if what 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 happens when you have edema of the feet when you are going to put the feet on the table and make it at a higher place than the rest of the body, the swelling will go away. The water will be reabsorbed back. Okay, or it will be, it will be redistributed simply, right? So <clears throat> Of course, we take the history, we ask again, onset, progression, duration, aggravating factors, relieving factors, associated symptoms. And based on that knowledge, actually, we know what are the areas or what are the conditions in which edema can occur. For example, swelling can occur or edema can occur in liver failure, in kidney failure, in heart failure. It can occur in angioedema, it can occur in allergies, it can occur in sting bites. So it can occur like in many, many, many conditions. So of course, like after history, we go for examination. In examination, we check for the due, like the, like the distribution of the edema, which parts of the body are mostly affected, which area of the body are mostly affected. We see either it's a pedal edema, What is pedal edema? The edema which is in the in the in the feet. Okay. So, or like I give the example of prolonged sitting. If you are traveling, for example, from Beijing to London, you know, it's a long, long, long flight. Take twelve hours, or from Beijing to Melbourne. 12 hours okay so you keep on sitting and what happens like um, there is a, uh, what you can say accumulation of the fluid in, in your feet okay now why, why it is there is because you know when you are sitting over there there is uh, decreased venous drainage or you can say increased hydrostatic venous pressure and simply like there is Fluid will echo start accumulating there. So, uh, like that, this is one of the example. Of course, lymphedema is a different thing. Okay, so we always see like where is the thing? We see either that the edema is localized, is generalized, and one of the thing we check is uh, we check like either it's a pitting edema and non pitting edema. So see, what we do, we press the skin with our thumb or with our finger and then when after withdrawing we see like either the pit is there or the skin is coming back to its normal position. Okay. So whenever there is edema, first of all like we have to confirm either there is edema or not. So normally when you press the skin, you know, either it's like it's not compressive and if even if it's compressive, it stays there like this, okay, it, it, in edema. Otherwise a normal person, you know, it comes back in instantly, okay. So gently press thumb on skin against the bony surface, anterior tibia, fibula, dorsum of foot or sacrum. When thumb withdraw and intendation will remain for a long time. So see, it means edema is present. So not just to confirm edema, but other, uh, also to check like either it's uh, uh, pitting edema or non pitting edema, you can get the answers on this thing. So this is how we examine. So now, so if 
this indentation is will last longer it is called a spitting edema and when this in, indentation will come back after after a while it is called as non spitting edema so generalized edema could be due to uh, cardiac problems renal problems hepatic problems nutritional problem or general problems due to other other reasons okay so why see uh, when the heart is not functioning properly the blood will start pulling up in the veins and when the blood will start pulling up in the veins what will happen like there will be increase or hydrostatic pressure in the veins and the blood will start leaving the capillary or venules and it will start accumulating in in the dependent parts so that's the reason in cardiac edema you know the edema is in the dependent parts if the patient is mobilizing so the edema moves like you will edema the pedal edema the feet will be swollen right renal failure i told you like the kidneys will lose a lot of proteins and there will be decrease on water pressure same thing with hepatic edema same thing with nutritional edema there is no difference okay so when there is severe systemic edema we call it as anasar anas anasarca we call it as sorry so a severe edema Okay, so I was telling you it is called as an anas and as arca. Okay, this is like severe systemic edema is called as an as arca. So. <coughs> people may have this thing as well so these are the causes of generalized edema uh, rather you can like the rest you can see like what happens in cardiac edema actually my slide reading is bad like the things will be same increased systemic veins and capillary hydrostatic pressure increased secretion of aldosterone and water sodium hypertension so when there is cardiac failure you know the kidneys receive 20% of the cardiac output in this case you know the kidneys will receive less and when the kidneys will receive less what the kidneys will think they will think that like the kidney will sense a condition as decreased or hypovolemia in the body so renin angiotensin aldosterone system will be activated and once it will be activated they are going to start retaining more and more sodium in water and the patient may the condition can can will lead to edema or will you, you can say will make the condition worse situation worse so now what is jugular, jugular pulse you know basically uh, the blood returns to the right atrium by the help of superior and inferior vena cava and the superior vena cava it is receiving the blood from the above and there is a vein called as jugular vein in the neck which can be seen if you will put the patient on 45 degree degree angle you can see that in his neck you know there is a falling and decreasing level in the vein which will feel like it's beating and we always have to confirm that it is not it should not be carotid pulsation rather it should be jugular pulsation so whenever the heart failure is there the blood cannot pump blood properly so the blood will is going to pull up in the vein so what will happen jugular venous pressure will be raised the next veins of the the it's the neck the veins of the neck will become distended there will be back pressure on the liver as well can can cause hepatomegaly rather sometimes the pulses can be felt in the liver as well and there will be edema or you can say pedal edema okay 
in left sided heart failure there what will happen the blood is going to pool up inside the inside the lungs and what will what will happen is for as the pulmonary edema that's what they present with dyspnea so you can see distending neck and neck veins in heart failure so see the edema of the lower extremities before and after one thing which is very important clinical point uh when you are examining any patient and you don't know either there is swelling or not so one very good thing is to remember whenever there is a pair always compare so if someone is complaining that there is swelling in the one feet or one leg you have the patient <coughs> other <coughs> other feet or other leg you know just to compare with each other either one of them is swell, swell up one of like either there is swelling or not a very very important clinical point and one more thing for example this patient who have edema or pedal edema so in the treatment of these patients of course our first and the most important aim is to uh, treat this edema and to you can say throw the excessive fluid outside the body and what we do give for them is the drugs called as diuretics also what we do is like uh, uh, we give diuretics as well as uh, we put them on fluid restriction okay like the patients in which there is edema okay so of course like you have to decrease the water level in the in the body so what we do number one we put them on water restriction number second we can give them diuretics of course no added salt should be given because salt has sodium and sodium as i told you sodium define the intravascular capacity osmolarity so one very important thing you know uh, in the hospitals what we do for example when if we, if whenever we admit someone in the hospital and we have to see either they are losing fluids or they are still gaining more and more fluids so one of the best thing you know we can do is what we can uh, simply um, take their body weights like every day in the morning at the same time we do their weight body weight and we see like uh, either their weight is decreasing or increasing like normally we aim like to lose you can say half kg if there is too much water retention so half kg to 1 kg every day so <laughs> of course like uh, if someone have edema and uh, you admit them in the hospital uh, today the weight is 84 so you put them on water restriction water restriction doesn't means like no water at all but like limit the water intake so we put them on water restriction we start giving them diuretics so what we'll do we will keep on doing their weight okay and see like either they are losing weight or gaining weight for example see uh, no one can lose or gain proteins and fats like this like 2 kg in one day okay. of course it takes time to lose and it takes time to gain so of course if someone is losing like this much in one day so it is the water they are losing uh, not the proteins or not the fats so this is a very important point so again the factors of renal edema there can be there is reduction in the plasma albumin glomerular tubule imbalance increased secretion of aldosterone and decreased secretion of prostaglandins so this one the, the renal edema remember guys it first appear in the areas of decreased tissue pressure such as eye tissues and face and that's the reason that you know the renal edema basically start appearing first around the eyes or it is called as puffy eyes okay you can google the photograph and you can see or i can show you here the eyes become puffy like this too much fluid because you know that the tissue around the eyes is very loose there's a loose tissue present so you know first first of first of all this area get fill up and we call it as 
Like this is one of the signs you can say for the renal patients to see. So see what is the difference between the renal edema and the cardiac edema. First area in the renal edema is the eyelids. In the cardiac edema it is dependent parts, the feet. Period development rapid in cardiac edema it is low. Quality of edema. Renal edema is soft and mobile. Cardiac edema is hard, low mobility. And in renal patients you will found hypertension, abnormal urine and renal function. In cardiac edema, you will find enlarged heart, cardiac murmurs, enlarged liver, as well as dilated neck veins. <clears throat> Hepatic edema has the same things, portal hypertension, hyperproteinemia, obstruction of lymphatic channels, increased secretion of aldosterone. So what happens like there is a lot of collection of fluid in, into the peritoneal cavity or in the abdominal cavity. And... Uh, you had done physical examination of the abdomen if you remember from that part how we check like someone have abdominal edema or not is simply by doing uh, shifting dullness and uh, fluid thrill if you know that's good because if you, you like your abdominal examination lecture is done so uh, you can you can revise that thing okay how we how we do that so by sh shifting the lens and the fluid thrill so this is someone who have a particular you must see a very 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 big tummy collection of fluid he is a patient of hepatic failure Nutritional edema, of course, like uh, in pediatrics, you will study this condition called as quasher core. They have nutritional deficiencies, they have chronic wasting disease, they have less protein intake, they have GIT disorders. So what happened, like there is thinning and body weight drops appear before edema and there is subcutaneous fat reduction. So, other than this thing, you know, there is one more edema called as mixed edema, this one. Mixed edema occurs in hypothyroidism. Basically, what is mixed edema? Mixed edema is, uh, uh, there is collection of, you know, uh, different type of things into the, uh, into the dermis. So, what happens in these patients is like, basically, they have, uh, Increased deposition of mucopolysaccharides, or you can say uh, connective tissue, you can say simply connective tissue is more and more deposited under the skin, and that's the reason that you know, uh, like they, they, they develop this, this type of edema. Okay, so uh, this one is like this one occurs in thyroid disorders. Hypothyroidism characterized by hard edema of subcutaneous tissue due to loss of thyroid function. So their head can become really hard because in this one there is deposition of connective tissue. So that's why they start this collection of water. That's what is called as mixed edema. But rather there is a collection of tissues. Okay. There is no, it's a non pitting edema. And there is increased protein in the tissue fluid. And the last one which we are going to cover is localized edema. So localized edema, as you know, like, you know, if your one part of the body is affected, so of course, like, it is localized edema, most commonly due to lymphatic or ve venous drainage obstruction. So whenever it is there, there will be increased capillary permeability. Okay. For example, this one. This is the condition called as elephantiasis or filarial disease. This is the worm which causes this condition and, you know, this condition is related to lymphatic, see this one. So of course there is local edema, like when you will see these patients, the rest of the body is fine, just this is the area which is affected. Or for example, someone in which the superior vena cava, I have just now, so superior vena cava collect the blood from the head and neck. So someone who have superior vena cava is blocked, the blood cannot drain out from, the, it can enter through the arteries, but cannot drain out back to the heart. 
so you will found like the edema of the head and neck congestion of the head and neck so it is also example of local edema so that thing of course then we look the, with the of course like it is not just the edema rather we look at, at, at the other symptoms what other symptoms the patient may have okay like distended neck veins can point towards cardiac edema as well as superior vena cava obstruction if a large liver is there think about cardiac causes hepatic causes heavy protein urea is there think about renal causes dyspnea and cyanosis they are think about heart diseases if someone lfts are not normal think about hepatic conditions so the, the, of course like we we think in this way we we, we see the other signs and symptoms so just before what you can say finishing this lecture uh, i would like to talk about or show you this flow chart which is very helpful how we can think about either the patient have what kind of thing of course like whenever there is edema then our story starts from here either it's spitting or non spitting you can see there are three types of edema localized or generalized which we cover lymphatic obstruction when the lymph lymphatics are destroyed and mixed edema when there is subdermal interstitial fluid is rich in mucopolysaccharides so as i told you there is deposition of deposition of more and more connective tissue like hyalo hyalo uronic acid and all these things so okay this one is of course like see whenever it is localized or generalized edema there is increase in interstitial fluid retention with normal lymphatic drainage okay this, this thing is important the lymphatic drainage is normal so when the, we with application when we apply pressure fluid drains out of the area receiving the pressure into the surrounding interstitium forming a visible indentation in the skin when pressure is released so pretty good am i right and in these cases if you will see increased interstitial fluid is held in lymphatic channels so lymphatics are blocked of course and in this one you can see in mixed edema there is increased interstitial on cortic pressure draws more fluid into the interstitium and fluid is highly viscous so drainage through the lymphatics is reduced so what happens there is increased interstitial fluid in this one again same but here the normal lymphatic drainage there here the lymphatic drainage, drainage is reduced so when we apply pressure fluid is pushing along the lymphatic vessels and returns as soon as the pressure is reduced okay so that's what they cause non pitting edema so this is like the difference between pitting edema as well as the non pitting edema so a very helpful you can say very very helpful thing so this one is like the diagnostic approach to bilateral lower extremity edema so first of all we will take the clinical examination and the history do it suggest a systemic illness yes check either it's cardiac it's hepatic it's renal okay if no then check either it's chronic or it's acute so whenever it's acute it is it can be medication induced whenever it is chronic then think about the same thing lymphedema and lipoedema all the same right so very very easy like if you will make good concept that's it okay so okay so uh, that's like uh, that's all about uh, edema okay uh, and i hope like you understand this thing if you did not understand guys open gaitan this is very important message okay thank you so much <laughs>